Rock Springs Massacre The Rock Springs Massacre, also known as the Rock Springs Riot, occurred on September the 2nd, 1885, in the present-day United States city of Rock Springs, Wyoming, in Sweetwater County. The riot between Chinese immigrants miners and white, mostly immigrant miners, was the result of racial tensions and an ongoing labor dispute over the Union Pacific Coal Department's policy of paying Chinese miners lower wages than white miners. When the rioting ended, at least 28 Chinese miners were dead and 15 were wounded. Rioters burnt 75 Chinese homes, resulting in approximately 150,000 US dollars in property damage. Tension between whites and Chinese immigrants in the late 19th century American West was particularly high, especially in the decade preceding the violence. The massacre in Rock Springs was the violent outburst of years of anti-coolie sentiment in the United States. The 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act suspended Chinese immigration for 10 years, but not before thousands of immigrants came to the American West. Most Chinese immigrants to Wyoming Territory took jobs with the railroad at first, but many ended up employed in coal mines owned by the Union Pacific Railroad. As Chinese immigration increased, so did anti-Chinese sentiment from, from whites. The Knights of Labor, one of the foremost voices against Chinese immigrant labor, formed a chapter in Rock Springs in 1883, and most rioters were members of that organization. No connection was ever established between the riot and the National Knights of Labor Organization. In the immediate aftermath of the riot, federal troops were deployed in Rock Springs. They escorted the surviving Chinese miners, most of whom had fled to Evanston, Wyoming, back to Rock Springs a week after the riot. Reaction came swiftly from the era's publications. In Rock Springs, the local newspaper endorsed the outcome of the riot. While in other Wyoming newspapers, support for the riot was limited to sympathy for the causes of the white miners. The massacre in Rock Springs touched off a wave of anti-Chinese violence, especially in the Puget Sound area of Washington Territory. This article consists of six main sections. Section 1. Background. Section 2. Causes. Section 3. Massacre. Section 4. Outcome. Section 5. Post-massacre violence. And Section 6. Significance and context. Section 1. Background. Chinese immigration to the U.S. was not uniform or widespread. J.R. Tucker, writing for the North American Review in 1884, stated that the vast majority of the nearly 100,000 Chinese immigrants resided within the American West, California, Nevada, Oregon, and Washington Territory. The U.S. Minister to China, George Seward, had asserted similar numbers in Scribner's magazine five years earlier. The first jobs Chinese laborers took in Wyoming were on the railroad, working for the Union Pacific Company, UP, as maintenance of the way workers. Chinese workers soon became an asset to Union Pacific and were found along UP lines and in UP coal mines from Laramie to Evanston. Most Chinese workers in Wyoming ended up working in Sweetwater County, but a large number settled in Carbon County and Uinta County. Most or all Chinese people in the area were men working in the mine. Racism against Chinese immigrants was widespread and largely uncontroversial at the time. J. R. Tucker, in the aforementioned 1884 article, referred to Asian immigrants as the Asiatic race, alien in blood, habits, and civilization. He also noted, Chinese are the chief element in this Asiatic population. In 1874-75, after labor unrest disrupted coal production, the Union Pacific Coal Department hired Chinese laborers to work in their coal mines throughout southern Wyoming. In 
Even so, Chinese population rose slowly at first. However, where there were Chinese immigrants, they were generally concentrated in one area. At Red Desert, a remote section camp in Sweetwater County, there were twenty inhabitants, of whom twelve were Chinese. All twelve were laborers who worked under an American foreman. To the east of Red Desert was another remote section camp, Washaki. An American section foreman lived there amongst twenty-three others, including thirteen Chinese laborers and an Irish crew foreman. In the various section camps along the main line of the Union Pacific Railroad, Chinese workers far outnumbered any other nationality. Though the 79 Chinese in Sweetwater County in 1870 represented only 4% of the total population, they were again concentrated. In Rock Springs and Green River, the largest towns along the UP line, there were no Chinese residents reported in 1870. Throughout the 1870s, the Chinese population in Sweetwater County <coughs> and all of Wyoming steadily increased. During the decade, Wyoming's total population rose from 9,118 to 20,789. In the 1870 U.S. Census, what the government today calls Asian and Pacific Islander, represented only 143 members of the population of Wyoming. The increase during the 1870s was the largest percentage increase in the Asian population of Wyoming of any decade since. The increase represented a 539% jump in the Asian population. By 1880, most Chinese residents in Sweetwater County lived in Rock Springs. At that time, Wyoming was home to 914 Asians. That number fell significantly during the 1880s to 465. Although most Chinese workers in 1880 were employed in the coal mines around Wyoming and Sweetwater County, the Chinese in Rock Springs worked mostly in occupations outside of mining. In addition to Chinese laborers and miners, a professional gambler, a priest, a cook and a barber resided in the city. In Green River, Wyoming, there was a Chinese doctor. Chinese servants and waiters found work in Green River and in Fort Washakie. In Atlantic City, Wyoming, Miners Delight, Wyoming, and Red Canyon, Wyoming, Chinese gold miners were employed. However, the majority of the 193 Chinese residing in Sweetwater County by 1880 worked in the coal mines or on the railroad. Section 2. Causes the riot was the result of a combination of race prejudice and general resentment against Union Pacific. In 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act required that from and after the expiration of 90 days next after the passage of this Act, and until the expiration of 10 years next after the passage of this Act, the coming of Chinese laborers to the United States be, and the same is hereby suspended, and during such suspension, it shall not be lawful for any Chinese laborer to come. In the years preceding the Rock Springs Massacre, the importation of Chinese labor was seen as a system worse than slavery. The white miners at Rock Springs, comprised of mostly Swedish, Welsh, Irish and Cornish immigrants, believed that lower-paid Chinese laborers drove down their wages. The Chinese at Rock Springs were well aware of the animosity and rising racial tension with white miners. Previously, they had never taken any precautions, as no prior events led them to believe a race riot would be the end result. Underlying the outbreak of violence were racism and resentment of the policies of the Union Pacific Corps Department. Until 1875, the mines in Rock Springs were worked by whites. In that year, a strike occurred and the strikers were replaced with Chinese strike breakers less than two weeks after the strike began. The company resumed mining with 50 white miners and 150 Chinese miners in its employ. As more Chinese arrived in Rock Springs, bitterness from the white miners increased. At the time of the massacre, there were about 150 white miners and 331 Chinese miners in Rock Springs. In the two years before the massacre, 
a white man's town was established in Rock Springs. By 1883, the Knights of Labor organized a chapter in Rock Springs. The Knights were one group that spearheaded opposition to, to Chinese labor during the 1880s. In 1882, the Knights had worked for the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act. Even so, the Rock Springs Massacre and the exclusion of Chinese workers were not the most significant events in the history of the Knights of Labor. There is no proof from the National Knights of Labor Organization was behind the massacre at Rock Springs, but the group's strong anti-Chinese position was weakened as a result of the riot. In August 1885, notices were posted from Evanston to Rock Springs, Wyoming, demanding the expulsion of Chinese immigrants and on the evening of September the 1st, 1885, one day before the violence, white miners in Rock Springs held a meeting regarding the Chinese immigrants. It was rumored that threats were made that night against the Chinese, according to the immigrants who were living there. Section 3. Massacre At 7 a.m. on September the 2nd, 1885, ten white men, in ordinary garb and miners' uniforms, arrived at the coal pit number six at the Rock Springs mine. They declared that the Chinese laborers had no right to work in a particularly desirable room in the mine. Miners were paid by the ton, thus location was important to the miners. A fight broke out, and two Chinese workers at pit number six were badly beaten. The white miners, most of whom were members of the Knights of Labor, walked out of the mine. After the work stoppage at pit number six, more white miners assembled near the town. They marched to Rock Springs by way of the railroad, carrying firearms. At about 10 a.m., the bell in the Knights of Labor meeting hall tolled, and the miners inside the building joined the already large group. There were white miners who opted to go to saloons instead of joining the gathering mob, while by 2 p.m. the saloons and grocers were persuaded by a Union Pacific official to close. With the saloons and grocers closed, about 150 men, armed with Winchester rifles, moved toward Chinatown in Rock Springs. They moved in two groups and entered Chinatown by crossing separate bridges. The larger group entered by way of the railroad bridge and was divided into squads, a few of which remained standing on the opposite side of the bridge outside Chinatown. A smaller group entered by way of the town's plank bridge. Squads from the larger group broke off and moved up to the hill toward Corpit number 3. One squad took up, a, took up a position at the pit number 3 coal shed. Another at the pump house. The first gunshots were fired by the squad at the pump house, according to Chinese miners, followed by a volley from the, those at the coal shed. Lorsun Kit, a Chinese, la Chinese laborer, was shot and fell to the ground, but the Chinese did not flee the scene. As the group at Corpit No. 3 rejoined them, the crowd pressed on toward Chinatown, some men firing their weapons as they went. The smaller group of white miners at the plank bridge divided itself into squads and surrounded Chinatown. One squad stayed at the plank bridge to cut off any Chinese escape. As the white miners moved into Chinatown, the Chinese became aware of the riot and that Leo Dayaba and Yip Aman, residents from the west and east sides of Chinatown, had already been killed. As the news of the murder spread, the Chinese fled in fear and confusion. They ran in every direction, up the hill behind coal pit number three, others along the base of the hill at coal pit number four, others still from the eastern end of town fled across Bitter Creek to the opposite hill and more fled the western end of Chinatown across the base of the hill to the right of Corpit No. 5. The mob came from three directions by the time, from the east and west ends of town and from the wagon road. The Chinese immigrants pre present at the Rock Springs Massacre presented their own grisly account of the melee to the Chinese consul in New York. Quote, Whenever the mob met a Chinese, they stopped him, and, pointing a weapon at him, asked him if he had any revolver, and then approaching him they searched his person, robbing him of his watch or any gold or silver that he might have about him before letting him go. Some of the rioters would let a Chinese go after depriving him of all his gold and silver, 
while, other, while another Chinese would be beaten with the butt ends of the weapons before being let go. Some of the rioters, when they could not stop a Chinese, would shoot him dead on the spot, and then search and rob him. Some would overtake a Chinese, throw him down and search and rob him before they would let him go. Some of the rioters would not fire the weapons, but would only use the butt ends to beat the Chinese with. Some would not beat a Chinese, but rob him of whatever he had and let him go, yelling to him to go quickly. Some, who took no part either in beating or robbing the Chinese, stood by, shouting loudly and laughing and clapping their hands. End quote. By 3.30 p.m. the massacre was well underway. The women in Rock Springs had gathered in a group at the Plank Bridge, where they stood and cheered the rampage on. Two women present fired shots at the Chinese. As the riot wore on into the night, the Chinese miners scattered into the hills, lying in the grass to hide. Between 4 and 9 p.m., rioters set fire to the camp houses belonging to the coal company. By 9 p.m., all but one Chinese camp house was burned completely. In all, 79 Chinese homes were destroyed by fire. Damage to Chinese-owned property was estimated at around 147,000 U.S. dollars. Of the Chinese killed, some died on the banks of Bitter Creek as they fled others as they fled. Others near the railroad bridge as they attempted to escape Chinatown. The rioters threw Chinese bodies into the flames of burning buildings. Other Chinese immigrants, who had hid in their houses instead of fleeing, were murdered and then their bodies were burned with their houses. Those who could not run, including the sick, were burned alive in their camp houses. One remaining Chinese immigrant was found dead in a laundry house in Whitemanstown, his home demolished by rioters. In total, 28 Chinese miners were confirmed uh, dead, and at least 15 were wounded. There is speculation about the exact number of Chinese killed in Rock Springs. Various sources assert that 40 to 50 might be a more accurate number, as some of those who fled were never accounted for. Section 4 Outcome. Section 4.1 Immediate Aftermath. In the days following the riot, surviving Chinese immigrants in Rock Springs fled and were picked up by Union Pacific trains. By September the 5th, almost all survivors were in Evanston, Wyoming, 100 miles west of Rock Springs. Once there, they were subjected to threats of murder and other crimes. Evanston was another area in Wyoming where anti-Chinese sentiment was high. Rumors of the return of the Chinese to Rock Springs circulated since immediately after the riots. On September the 3rd, the Rock Springs Independent published an editorial which confirmed the rumors of the return, as a few Chinese began to trickle back into town to search for valuables. The Independent said of the return of Chinese laborers to Rock Springs, quote, It means that Rock Springs is killed as far as white men are concerned if such program is carried out." End quote. The massacre was defended in the local newspaper and, to an extent, in other Western newspapers. In general, however, Wyoming newspapers disapproved of the acts of the, mass of the massacre while supporting the cause of white miners. Wyoming Territorial Governor Francis E. Warren visited Rock Springs on September the 3rd, 1885, the day after the riot, to make a personal assessment. After his trip to Rock Springs, Warren traveled to Evanston, where he sent telegrams to U.S. President Grover Cleveland appealing for federal troops. Back in Rock Springs, the riot had calmed, but the situation was still unstable. Two companies of the United States Army's 7th Infantry arrived on September 5, 1885. One company, under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Anderson, was stationed in Evanston, Wyoming. The other, under Colonel Chipman, was stationed in Rock Springs. At Camp Murray, Utah Territory, a Colonel McCook was ordered to augment the garrison sent to Wyoming with six small companies. On September 9, 1885, one week after the massacre, six companies of soldiers arrived in Wyoming. Four of the six companies then escorted the Chinese back to Rock Springs. 
Once back in Rock Springs, the Chinese laborers found scorched tracts of land standing where the homes once had. The mining company had buried only a few dead. Others remained lying in the open, mangled, decomposing, and partially eaten by dogs, hogs, or other animals. The situation in Rock Springs was stabilized as early as September the 15th, when Warren first requested the removal of federal troops, but the mines at Rock Springs remained closed for a time. On September the 30th, 1885, white miners, mostly Finnish immigrants who were members of the Knights of Labor, walked out of mines in Carbon County, Wyoming, in protest of the company's continued use of Chinese miners. In Rock Springs, the white miners were not back at work in late September because the company still used Chinese labor. Rock Springs steadily became quieter, <clears throat> and, and on October the 5th, 1885, emergency troops, except for two companies, were removed. However, the temporary posts of Camp Medicine Butte, established in Evanston, and of Camp Pilot Butte in Rock Springs remained long after the riot. Camp Pilot Butte closed in 1899, after the onset of the Spanish-American War. The labor strike was unsuccessful, and the miners went back to work within a couple of months. The National Knights of Labor organization refused to support the carbon strike and the holdout by white miners in Rock Springs following the Rock Springs riot. The organization avoided supporting the miners along the Union Pacific Railroad because it did not want to be seen as condoning the violence at Rock Springs. When the Union Pacific Coal Department reopened the mines, it fired 45 white miners connected to the violence. Section 4.2 Arrests After the riot in Rock Springs, 16 men were arrested, including Isaiah Washington, a member elect to the territorial legislature. The men were taken to jail in Green River, where they were held until after a Sweetwater County grand jury refused to bring indictments. In explaining its decision, the grand jury declared that there was no, no cause for legal action, stating in part that we have diligently inquired into the occur occurrence at Rock Springs. Though we have examined a large number of witnesses, no one has been able to testify to a single criminal act committed by any known white person that day. Those arrested as suspects in the riot were released a little more than a month later, on October the 7th, 1882. On the release they were, quote, met by several hundred men, women and children, and treated to a regular ovation, end quote, according to the New York Times. The defendants in the Rock Springs case enjoy the same broad community consent that lynch mobs often receive. As a result, no person or persons were ever convicted in the violence at Rock Springs. Section 4.3 Diplomatic and Political Issues The riot in Rock Springs had consequences beyond the confines of the mining industry, Wyoming, or even the broader American West. After the riot, the U.S. government hesitated to make amends to the Chinese for the massacre. In China, the Governor General of the Guangdong region suggested that Americans in China might be the target of revenge for the events in Rock Springs. Indeed, the American envoy to China, Charles Harvey Denby, and others in the diplomatic corps reported rising anti-American sentiment in Hong Kong and in Canton, Guangdong, following the riot. The American diplomats warned the government that the backlash from the massacre could ruin U.S. trade with China. They also reported that British merchants and newspapers in China were encouraging the Chinese to stand up for the repressed countrymen in America. Then be advised that U.S. Secretary of State Thomas Bayard obtained compensation for the victims of the massacre. The United States government agreed to pay compensation for the damaged property, but not for the actual victims of the massacre, although Bayard was inclined to resist the requests for payments. In a letter to the Minister of China's Washington legation, dated February 18, 1886, he expressed a personal view that the violence against Chinese immigrants was precipitated by the resistance to cultural assimilation, and that racism against Chinese 
was typically found among other immigrants rather than the majority of the populace. Quote, Chinese immigrants segregate themselves from the rest of the residents and citizens of the United States and refuse to mingle with the mass of population. As a cons consequence, race prejudice has been more excited against them, notably among aliens of other nationalities. End quote. However, Denby's prediction caused Bayard to seek a congressionally appropriated indemnity. At Bayard's urging, the U.S. Congress provided 147,748 U.S. dollars and 74 cents as an indemnity. The compensation was made as a monetary gift and not as a legal decree of responsibility for the massacre, and the outcome amounted to a minor diplomatic victory for China. In Wyoming, Governor Warren's reaction to the massacre was probably, in part, due to personal business holdings, as well as a desire to protect Chinese miners, and it helped make his career as a politician. Letters prove that Warren was close to Union Pacific officials during his term in office, and that he petitioned the company for years to clear the titles on land he owned. Warren condemned the riot as the most brutal and damnable outrage that ever occurred in any country. Section 4.4 Reaction After the riot, rhetoric and reaction came from publications and key political figures concerning the events. The New York Times blasted the city of Rock Springs in the first of at least two editorials on the topic, stating, The appropriate fate for a community of this kind would be that of Sodom and Gomorrah. In another Times editorial on November 10, 1885, the paper continued to assail not only the residents of Rock Springs who were involved in the violence, but those who stood by and let the mob continue its behavior. Newspapers in Wyoming, such as the Cheyenne Tribune and the Larry Boomerang, reacted with sympathy toward the white miners. The Boomerang stated it regretted the riot, but found extenuating circumstances surrounding violence. In addition to newspapers, anti-Chinese sentiment and stereotypes came from other publications. Religious publications, such as Baptist Missionary Magazine, depicted the Chinese as heathens. The Chautauquan, a weekly news magazine, characterized the Chinese as weak and defenseless, stating in its coverage of the massacre, To murder an industrious Chinaman is the same kind of fiendish work as the murder of women and children. It is equally a violation of the rights of the defenseless. Powerful Knights of Labor leader Terence Powderly wrote in a letter to W. W. Stone, excerpts of which he included in a report to the U.S. Congress, that it is not necessary for me to speak of the numerous reasons given for the opposition to this particular race, their habits, religion, customs, and practices. Powderly blamed the problem of Chinese immigration on the failings of the 80, 1882 Exclusion Act. He faulted lax law enforcement, not those involved in the riots for the attacks at Rock Springs. Powderly wrote that the U.S. Congress should stop winking at the violations of this statute and reform the laws which barred Chinese immigration, which he believed could have prevented incidents such as the recent assault upon the Chinese at Rock Springs. In December 1885, U.S. President Grover Cleveland presented his State of the Union report to Congress, and in it his reaction to the Rock Springs Massacre. Cleveland's report pointed out that America was interested in good relations with China. He stated, All of the power of this government should be exhorted to maintain the amplest good faith towards China in the treatment of these men, and the inflexible sternness of the law must be insisted upon. Cleveland noted that race prejudice is the chief factor to originating these disturbances. Section 5. Post-Massacre Violence The massacre at Rock Springs led to other incidents of anti-Chinese aggression, primarily in Washington Territory, though there were incidents in Oregon and other states as well. Near Newcastle, Washington, a mob of whites burned down the barracks of 36 Chinese coal miners. Throughout the Puget Sound area, Chinese workers were driven out of communities 
and subject to violence in cities and towns such as Tacoma, Seattle, Newcastle, and Issaquah. Chinese workers were driven out of other Washington towns, but sources indicated, as early as 1891, that the above were specifically connected to the wave of violence touched off at Rock Springs. The wave of anti-Chinese violence in the western United States following the Rock Springs riot spread further to the state of Oregon. Mobs drove Chinese workers out of small towns throughout the state in late 1885 and mid-1886. Other states reported incidents as well. As far away as Augusta, Georgia, anger was expressed against the Chinese in response to the massacre at Rock Springs. According to the New York Times, the rioting in Rock Springs fueled the desire of anti-Chinese Georgians in Augusta to air their grievances. Section 6. Significance and Context The Rock Springs massacre was seen by observers at the time, and by historians today, as the worst, most significant instance of anti-Chinese violence in the 19th century United States. The riot received widespread media coverage from publications such as the National Police Gazette and the New York Times. Among the events of anti-Chinese violence in the American West, the Rock Springs Massacre is considered the most widely publicized. The attacks at Rock Springs were extraordinarily violent, revealing a long-held, almost feral hatred of the victims. The sheer brutality of the violence startled the entire country. Besides those who were burned alive, Chinese miners were scalped, mutilated, branded, decapitated, dismembered, and hanged from gutter spouts. One of the Chinese miners had his penis and testicles cut off and toasted in a nearby saloon as a trophy of the hunt. The events amounted to racial terrorism. Today, nearly all historians hold the view that the prime factor which contributed to the riot was race prejudice. However, a 1990 work on the Rock Springs Massacre, written by journalist Craig Storty, marginalized the racial factor and put a stronger emphasis on the economic factors which contributed to violence. His book, Incident at Bitter Creek, The Rock Springs Massacre, was widely criticized in reviews. Though Storty stated he represented the historical record as it stood. There were labor considerations that contributed to the violence in Rock Springs, though they are generally seen as less significant. The use of Chinese workers by the railroad during an 1875 strike created widespread resentment among the white miners, which continued to build until the Rock Springs massacre. Storty's book described anti-Chinese racism as pervasive, even while downplaying its significance to the riot. The failure of the Chinese to assimilate into American culture is largely a myth and long-perpetuated stereotype. Regardless, the view was held historically and still carries weight within the modern-day inter interpretation of the historical record. Modern-day modern day Rock Springs is no longer the mining town it was in 1885. With a population pushing 20,000, the former settlement is a full-fledged city. The area that once encompassed Camp Pilot Butte is located on the north bank of Bitter Creek, in the northwest part of the city. The camp covered five and a half acres of Union Pacific property. The parade ground was in the center of a present-day city block, bounded by Salisbury Street on the west, Pilot Butte Avenue on the east, Bridger Avenue on the north, and Elias Avenue on its south. In 1973, the area where the Army Post once existed was listed on the U.S. National Register of Historic Places as an historic district. At that time, there were only two remaining original structures. The two buildings were owned by the St. Cyril and Methodius Catholic Church in Rock Springs. The buildings are no longer extant, and the property is no longer listed on the National Register. The area that was once Chinatown, just to the north of where Camp Pilot Butte once stood, had a public elementary school built over part of it. In general, the locations in Rock Springs associated with the massacre have been surrounded and absorbed 
by the city's growth.